Hello, everyone. So glad everyone is here. My name is Kelly Jackson, and I'm the Senior Festival Manager for the 20th Annual MVAAFF. We're so glad we're here. We're so proud to be celebrating 20 years on this beautiful beach island. I'd like to take the time right now to introduce Dr. Lisa Coleman, Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation at NYU, and NYU Professor Casey Lemons. Good afternoon, everyone. As, hello. My name is Dr. Lisa Coleman, as was just announced, and I'm thrilled to be your host for today's Legacy Spotlight in the Color of Conversation series. Today, we'll be joined by the dynamic and brilliant Casey Lemons. Casey is an NYU professor and is a proven talent as an American film director, screenwriter, and actress who continues <laughs> who continues to creatively tantalize with her thought-provoking body of work. And I have been a fan since <laughs> Eve's Bayou. I'm that old. Professor Lemon's works as an actress includes roles in Silence of the Lambs, opposite Jodie Foster, John Woo's first American film, Hard Target, Rusty Kundiev's parody of the rap industry, Fear of a Black Hat. Candyman with Virginia Madsen, Spike Lee's School Days, and Vampire's Kiss with Nicolas Cage. Lemon's feature-length feature film, Eve's Bayou, became the highest grossing film of 1997. Yes. The film won the Independent Spirit Award for Best First Feature and received not one, not two, not three, seven NAACP Image Award nominations, including Best Picture. In addition, Lemons received a special first-time director, and we're gonna talk about this later, but remember, first-time director, created just for her for the National Board of Review. She also won the Director's Achievement Award at the ninth annual Norder Palm Springs Film Festival. The Caveman's Valentine, her follow-up feature to the claimed Ease Bayou opened, in two, opened 2002 Sundance Film Festival to audience and critical acclaim. The Caveman Valentine was a co-production of Danny DeVito's Jersey Films and features Eve's Bayou star Samuel L. Jackson. For the 2002 Oscar Stella cast, Casey directed a touching tribute to Sidney Poitier. She was also involved in the exploration of roles and representations of black women in film for the 2003 Tribeca Film Festival. Lemon's third feature, Talk to Me, starring Don Cheadle, was released nationwide in July 2007 by Focus Features to widespread critical acclaim. She received the 2008 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Directing. The film also earned a Gotham Award for the Best Ensemble Cast. Lemons feature Black Nativity, an adaption of Langston Hughes' musical of the same name, was released nationwide Thanksgiving 2013 by Fox Searchlight. Her latest opus is Harriet, a deeply resonant and powerful drama based on the American icon Harriet Tubman. Starring Cynthia Ervo in the title world, Harriet was released by Focus Features in late 2019. Harriet received two Academy Award nominations two gold, Golden Globe nominations, and yes again, 10 NAACP award nominations. <laughs> Lemons has worked extensively as a mentor and educator. For the past 14 years, she's been a board member of the Film Independent and has contributed to the Phil Independent Filmmakers Lab as a speaker and moderator. She also continues to serve as an advisor for the Sundance Screenwriter and Filmmakers Labs. Guest teaching and speaking credits include Yale University, MIT, UCLA, USC, the Los Angeles Film School, the University of Princeton Film in Kosovo, as well as attending New York University School of the Arts, USC, UCLA, and the New School of Social Research Film Program. Lemon was awarded honorary degrees, doctors of humane letters from Salem State College in 1998, and currently, and I have the pleasure of working with her at New York University where she works in our Chiss School of the Arts, and we are lucky, lucky to have you. you. 
Along with the Academy Award-nominated Terence Blanchard, Lemons recently added <laughs> librettist as if she didn't have enough accomplishments to her formidable body of work, creating the stage adaptation of Charles Blow's New York Times best-selling memoir, Fire Shove in My Bones, for the Opera Theater of St. Louis. Lemons adapted that novel, Fire Shut Up in the Bones by Chesler, and it was premiered in 2019 on June 15th and opened, yes, in 2021, 2022 at the Metropolitan Opera season, becoming the institution's first opera by African-American composer. She is currently and has limited production for Madame, Madame C.J. Walker's limited series, which you all may have seen, and of course, she is currently working on the Whitney biopic. Today, we are here to honor her for her pioneering work she did over 25 years ago. We have a special surprise for her later, so stick around for that. Let me just say these last few words. In 1997, Lemons directed the film *Ease Bayou, which of course we're gonna talk about today, with Samuel L. Jackson, Lynn Whitfield, W. Morgan, Diane Carroll, uh, Journey Smollett, among others. Lemons had begun to write the screenplay for *Ease Bayou in 1992. This was the first screenplay that she had written by herself, as I mentioned before, to convince the studios that she could direct *Ease Bayou*. She filmed Dr. Hugo, a short film based on a section of the script of East Bayou. East Bayou was well received, as many of you know, and is currently, oh, I love this, currently holding an 80% approval on the aggravator site, the uh, uh, Rotten Tomatoes. And you know, that's pretty good. You know that, Cassie, because they hold on to that, right? Uh, she won the Independent Spirit Award for Best Feature Film and is awarded as a National Board Review, as I said, for that outstanding directorial debut. And, and then, and then I would just like to say, and to this day, it stands as one of the most experimental, innovation, innovative films that has withstood the test of time and the arc of talking about intra, black, and community and family. Thank you for your contributions. I could go on and on, but this is not about me, so I'm moving over here now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for all of the work that you have done. It is an amazing, amazing career in arc. So let's get started. I want to talk to you first a little bit about your creative process. And as we think about, and you've talked a little bit about this, but I, I sort of alluded to this earlier, you have this brilliant way of reframing and reimagining a world. And, and interrogating things like memory, family, culture, in an experimental and innovative way. So tell us a little bit about your creative process in creating Eve's Bayou. Yeah, I mean, it, it was very interesting. It started off as um, short stories. Uh, it started off with me, actually, I was at an audition, and, um, and the casting director said, Instead of, you know, reading the sides, tell me a story, maybe about your family. And the story I told was about my Aunt Muriel. And I told the story where um, my Aunt Muriel and my mother, uh, her sister-in-law, went to a fair. And a fortune teller, you know, said something that my mother uh, couldn't really remember, you know. Uh, One day it'll all be okay, you know. Um, but she told my aunt, some things are better left unsaid. And I told that story, and then I was like, oh, I guess I should write this down. And, um, and then it joined some other short stories that I had written. And uh, it, it came, a lot of it came to me in dreams. And that's still the way I write. I write a lot from dreams, or that, that state that you're in when you're in between being awake and asleep. And, uh, you know, it developed through a big process. Um, a solitary process. So before I showed it to anyone, I had worked on it for probably a year or so. And uh, a lot of me came out in the process. A lot of what I had to say and what I had to interrogate and what I was interested in. Um, but also a lot of me, like just a lot of me came out. You said in other interviews that this was a personal story, mm -hmm. but not autobiography, not an autobiography. So talk to us a little bit about that idea of the personal and the, that vulnerability and bringing that to the, 
to this idea of story, mm -hmm. right? And but it's not not the autobiography. Mm -hmm. So you're actually exploring this dynamic of family right. as well. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, at a certain point, I realized that Eve was me. You know, but Eve was, um, you know, I was very inspired by Southern novelists and and um, and all kinds of novelists. I was very inspired by Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Toni Morrison, and you know, um, I think if you if you look at my work and you know that, you'll see it. You know, um, but I was also inspired by um, To Kill a Mockingbird. So Eve was a little bit of Scout in To Kill a Mockingbird. You know, and then at a certain point, I realized she was me. So it was more like that. It was, it was a process, you know, of realizing that my family, that I was talking about my family. And it's interesting that you bring this up because even as I read your bio, one of the things that you are, you're in conversation with other artists, mm -hmm. right? You're in conversation with Langston Hughes, as you just talked mm -hmm. about, in conversation with Morrison and other artists outside of even African-American culture. So talk to us a little bit about that conversation and creating a conversation. In fact, one of the things I was thinking about as I was thinking about your work and representation is, um, and I, we can come back to this, but in 1903, right, Du Bois does the, the with James Van Der Zee and thinking about representation of black people. And in your uh, story, which we I know a little bit about, talk to us a little bit navigating race and representation in film, et cetera, as you brought Eve's Bayou to the, uh, to other directors, et cetera, mm -hmm. and outside, and sort of the experiences that you had there. And talk to us, I'll remind you, tell us the story about Debbie Morgan's dress. Okay. So um, so this is, uh, you know, I, I, it's, uh, I have a lot to say about it, but I'll try and, um, and, and make a clear path to the dress. Um, but I was very, as I said, inspired by Dr. Toni Morrison. So, so in Toni's work, you get black world, right, often. You have a complete black world. And so, um, so I did have inspiration, you know, um, in creating a black world, but um, I didn't know how strongly I felt about it until that was challenged. And it was challenged in the, in the meeting process when I'm trying to get the film made. Um, people would say, well, why are there no white characters? Um, and then they would say, well, can you put a white character in, even if they're a racist? You know, it doesn't have to be a favorable character, just any white character. And, and you know, I said, well, it's not about you, you know? It's, it's not about you at all. As a matter of fact, we have perfectly full lives without thinking about y'all. <laughs> you know, and we don't spend every moment thinking about y'all. We have our own problems. And so this was a family that had their own problems, you know? They were working out things, and they, that was enough drama. That was enough drama. Um, but as I kept getting pushed against for that, I pushed back and I realized I felt very strongly and militantly about it to the point where when we shot, there are no white extras in his bite. There are no white people at all. And that was kind of, you know, I developed in that direction based on what I was getting. And what I was getting a lot was like, huh, I mean, I mean, they're kind of, they're glamorous, you know? I mean, is that real? And I say, yes, in fact, it's real. It's um, the way that adults look to me, not just my parents, but their whole circle of friends, right, were glamorous and fabulous, and they had fabulous parties. So I had this party sequence, and this now we're at the point where, you know, I'm talking to um, people that are actually even involved in, in, in areas of the film that are challenging me on Debbie Morgan's dress. She has on this fabulous pearl dress at Pearl, it's a beautiful dress at the party. And uh, I can't remember who asked me, but somebody said, well, do you think that's realistic? No, it was after the film came out. It was after the film came out in one of the early screenings. Somebody said, do you think that that's realistic? I think it might have even been a journalist that asked me this. And, um, did not think that that dress was realistic for an African-American woman of the time period that the film was set in, 1962. And I said, well, my line producer is an African-American man in his 60s, and that's his mother's dress. Okay, that's his mother's dress. You know, and just because you don't know it doesn't mean it ain't true. 
Thank you. That's exactly, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's actually brilliant. And, and so, let, le, moving from there, maybe piggybacking on that a little bit, one of the things that we know about this film, and many of you have just seen it, is it's really about family. Mm -hmm. And in the many ways, and you've talked about this also in other interviews, is the universality of family, yeah. right? And one of the things that I love that you actually have said earlier is about sort of the breadth and depth of that, mm -hmm. being so specific mm -hmm. in a location and place, mm -hmm. and then it becoming universal. So talk to us a little bit about that universality and this quote that you have, which is, the gray area of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, it's so specific, because in some ways it's about me and my family. Um, in other ways, it's about anybody's family, and that, that's what I really wanted to speak to, but in being so specific, culturally specific, in a specific, planted in a specific place and time, and, um, and from a very specific perspective, it has universality, you know, it can speak to anyone. And, and what I realize is everybody has very complex families, you know, everybody has very complex families. Everybody remembers events differently than their sister might, or their father might, right, or their brother might, and um, and everybody is messy, you know, everybody's messy, and boundaries are crossed, and you do you you hurt people unintentionally, and sometimes you're heroic, and sometimes you absolutely are not, and um, and we try and fail, and the th those are the things that make us human, and so what I'm trying to say with the film before I even knew that this, before I'd even thought through that this is what I'm trying to say, is it's, it's a human story, and that's what makes it relatable, you know? It's, it's watching people fail, you know? Watching, what, did I slap you? I didn't even know I did that, you know what I mean? Like, things that come out of no place, emotion that, that um, bubbles up and spills messily, you know? Um, that's, that's what I'm speaking to. And so, what, what we also know, we've talked about this being your first, yeah. first forge into this sort of area, and you had to bring an amazing cast of people together. Yeah. And in many ways, as the director, create a family in a certain way on the set, and you've talked about the intimacy. So let's talk about these actors, Megan Von Lynn, Diane, you know, Debbie, et cetera. So talk to us about how you worked with the actors, and I've heard you talk about it a little bit individually. So let's go through them and talk about how you brought them on board, but also how you brought them together collectively as a cast, right? Because then my next question is gonna be about friendship, because I, you're, I know you're gonna talk a little bit about that, but. Yeah, um, you know, in, in, in many ways, Sam, got helped get this movie made. I mean, you know, we need movie stars. And, um, and Samuel, when Samuel came on board, the film took a different uh, life, you know? I think people took meetings with me because I was interesting, you know? But they didn't, um, weren't necessarily gonna make the film until Samuel came on board. And so he was tremendous part of the process, uh, you know? And as, a, and as executive producer too, you know, just very, very valuable to have on board. And then um, Megan, you know, when, when we first started talking about making the film, Megan was reading Eve. And, uh, and she grew into a Sicily by the time we made the film. I'm like, you know, you want to read Sicily? <laughs> you know? She got older. She got right? older, as, as kids do, and, um, and became a Sicily. And so she, those, those, they were the two that I had first. And uh, we auditioned for... Uh, Rosalind and Lynn came in and threw down and was just spectacular and reminded me of my mother. Yes. And uh, Debbie Morgan, uh, who is my friend, came in and I, and I, I told her, you know, I, you're, you're who I see um, as this part. And she came in and she auditioned once. She wouldn't come back for a call back. She threw down and she was like, that's it, I dropped the mic. <laughs> uh, you know, Debbie Morgan out, right? And, <laughs> And we, we cast her because she was undeniably uh, the best person for that part. And um, Eve came last. Yes, tell us um, about that. Yeah, Eve came, you know, Diane might have come after Eve, but okay. Eve was very late in the process. Uh, very late in the process, I realized that I didn't have a lead and that I was, um, you know, uh, that I was living a lie because the, you know, my crew was in Louisiana we were prepping this movie and I didn't have 
uh, the title character. And um, I started to have a really, really bad feeling. I was auditioning tons of kids, and none of them had the quality that I was looking for. And I think I wasn't articulating that quality well, but I would say, like, she's earthy, you know? So kids would come in that were too cute or precocious, and it, it turned me off, you know? And then finally, um, my casting director called me and said, you gotta come back to LA, I think I found Eve. And then I went in a journey audition and just did the, it was just spectacular, a spectacular actor, but also was Eve. And uh, I worked with them all differently. And what it taught me as a director was that you really have to meet each actor where they are and be the director that that person needs you to be. Because kids, the kids needed something different than what Lynn needed and what Sam needed. And then Sam and Lynn needed, yeah, everybody was different. And so I learned to be kind of um, versatile in, in my approach to directing actors and, and to, um, you know, not take anything personally, just to kind of try and be the person, the director that they needed me to be. And as a first time director, that must have been an incredible learning experience to mm -hmm. go through that process at a, such, uh, at a formidable stage. And you've, you've also talked about that, the intimacy yeah. that needs to be created, and you were an actor. Mm -hmm. And so you brought that to your directing. Can you talk to our audience a little bit about what, how you think that informed your process as a director, being an actor? Yeah, I didn't really think about it at the time, but I did try and be the director that I liked. You know, what did I learn? I learned, well, I learned from Spike Lee that, I, that you don't have to raise your voice to be scary. <laughs> and, and I learned from, from John Woo who couldn't really communicate in English at the time and yet communicated perfectly. Um, and, and, and Jonathan Demi, I learned to be present. I mean, I've got to say, Demi really taught me to be, that a director should be absolutely, pre he was absolutely present, focused, and upbeat. And so I tried to be, you know, directors that I admired. I guess I was probably acting the role of the director a little bit. Um, but then I fell into it because it takes, absolute concentration, you know? And so what I tell my students is that you, you, you can't be self-conscious. There's no room for that. You have to be present enough to recognize what's happening in front of you. Because if there's magic, you know, sometimes that's subtle, right? And you have to be present enough to, to, to recognize, you know, what's happening around you. And, um, you know, so, so that's, did I answer your question? Yes, you do. Yes, you um, do. Yes. Yeah, it's intimate because you're watching their molecules. It's intimate because you're not going to leave until the hairs are standing up on the back of your neck, until you have a physical reaction from watching their molecules. You know, it's like alchemy or, you know, it's, it's, it's magical. And, and by the time I finish directing an actor, I know all kinds of things. I know things they don't know about themselves, you know, from watching their molecules. You actually said earlier, leaning into the soul, mm -hmm. right? That's what you wanted mm -hmm. someone to do for you as an actor, to lean into that. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Hear your soul speak. I mean, great actors are good at speaking with their souls. You know, um, you look at Journey, one of the last scenes of the movie, she's laying in a tree, right? She's laying back in a tree and, and her aunt Moselle comes. She doesn't speak in the scene. She doesn't speak and it's so powerful because she's absolutely present, you know, and her molecules, or she's alive. She's alive in the scene. So um, many want you to produce a sequel. <laughs> Eve's Bayou, number two. And, um, so <laughs> I've heard you say mixed things about that, and you can repeat that to our audience. But I did also hear you say, and I think this is true for writers, the characters are alive. Mm -hmm. They remain alive. They don't die, per se, mm -hmm. after the film is produced or over. So talk to us about the complications. Some of them die. Some of them because die. Because I oh, yes, killed okay. them, right? You killed them, that's right. <laughs> so talk to us a little bit about, right? both whether, you know, Eve's Bayou 2, but really about the life of the characters and that, that idea of the life of the characters, because whether they're alive or dead for you, they don't. Yeah, yeah, they all met, they met different, different fates, you know. Um, but, you know, they, I know what, exactly what happens to them, you know, and I know um, 
what they would be like in different situations. And they're, they're very much alive, particularly the Batiste of, of anybody that I've written or, or, or directed characters that I've directed. The Batiste are very, very alive. Um, and they, they talk to me still, you know. But do I, do I want to sequelize them? That's a really hard question, you know, because um, look, humbly, that was a mic drop. And, um, you know, I don't <laughs> He's like, you know, I did that. I did that with them. So they are alive then, and that, that was perfect, you know. I once had a conversation with Journey. I must have gotten some notion. And I called Journey and said, would you ever, you know? And she said, no, you're not going to do that. And I instantly forgot the idea because the, the rest of the conversation wasn't necessary. Because uh, part of me was like, oh, you're right, that's a terrible idea, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and I've got a very, very dear friend, my closest friend that's a director is Gina prince Bythewood, um, the, the fabulous Gina prince Bythewood, And she says the same thing about love and basketball. Drop the mic and you move on, you know? And, um, and I, think that, I think that that's equally as valid. So, so yes, there's a war, I, I know promises, you know, but, um, but I think I'm leaning towards leaving the Batiste there. And this leads me to my next question, which is around film as communication. You were mm -hmm. talking about this earlier, and I think it was a friend of yours who said, it's not a painting, mm -hmm. right? It's just a different it's my kind. my agent. Your agent. <laughs> it was your agent, a friend. OK. And it's a different kind of communication. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about film as communication, because I think this relates to what you're saying mm -hmm. and the arc of that communication. Yeah, I mean, I think all art is communication. All art is asking a question, right? Um, and I always call this question, this moves me, does it move you, right? And so, um, but yet when we look at film, you know, this is storytelling and that's been the same for a thousand years. Like you, you know, you, you're around a fire and, and you know, the griot is telling the story and, and the audience leans in or leans back or gets nervous, you know? Um, that is what is meant by that communication, you know? And yet I think we get, as, as artists, and I've certainly been guilty of it, we get precious and it's like it's mine, it's my bayou, you know? And um, my editor put, put that sign up in our, in our it's your bayou, you know, um, to remind me that it, that it was mine and, you know, and the ideas in it were mine. But at the same time, it's a collaboration on so many different levels. It's a collaboration with every department, every actor, every piece that goes into it. Um, and you're only as good as those pieces. And it's a collaboration with the audience. It's, it's communication. Are you leaning in? Do I have you, as a griot, do I have you in the palm of my hand? You know, am I making you uncomfortable? Yes, right? <laughs> I'm making you uncomfortable, right? So I also tell my students, great art is supposed to be triggering. You should be triggered, you know, because life is triggering, right? And art reflects life. Indeed it is. I'm going to shift a little bit here to just talk about you a little bit and navigating. You are one of the most premier, successful, and you have friends, of course, but film director and screen uh, writer. We think about Hollywood, et cetera. Hmm. So how do you stay grounded? I've spent the days, uh, you all know this, I've spent days with her at other places as well. She's one of the most humble and sort of grounded people I've ever actually met. And so I'm sort of curious about how you manage to stay that way, particularly navigating what we know are difficult uh, circumstances often within that environment. You know, an old friend of mine, a long time ago, probably over 30 years ago, you know, long, long time ago, um, said to me, you know, you gotta figure out how to wake up the same every day. And I do think that there's something, you know, you have to, and I tell my students this, you gotta figure out how to wake up the same every day, you know, and so if somebody's gassing you up, you know, you, you don't let that go to your head. And if, and if somebody is tearing you down, you don't let that go to your head. You know, you don't let that bring you down. You just kind of have to keep your feet on the ground because, um, because people try to tear you down all the time, you know, and people gas you up all the time. So to me, it's not difficult, but I got to tell you what helps is having a family, having children. You know, they're unimpressed. <laughs> they're unimpressed 
by what they call the Casey Lemon Show. <laughs> it doesn't work for them. You know, and, and I think that um, having family is helpful, realizing that there's something else much more important than making movies. And I take, I take making movies seriously. I think it's heroic, you know, um, because it, it involves increasing empathy. It involves making the world smaller. But having a family and having children, you know, and a husband, like, that keeps, that keeps me grounded. And also one of the things that you've talked about, um, and I'll come back to this idea of joy and fabulousness, but you also talked about friendship, mm -hmm. right, and community as you've made, as you made Eve's Bio, and then I've heard you talk about even some of your other, starting with Dr. Hugo. Mm -hmm. And so talk to us about growing up together, right, in the film, some of you, Debbie, others, yeah. and how that has sustained you, how that's worked as well. Well, I mean, you know, Debbie and I go way, way back. Lynn and I go way back. You know, Sam and I go way back. And um, I think it's super important. You know, I just did a movie, uh, I'm, I'm on the, the Whitney Houston movie, and you know, Tamara Tooney is one of the stars, and Tamara and I did soaps, you know, together. You know, and, and so knowing people when you're a young actor, you know, when you're in theater, and having those relationships, or your first film festival. You know, one of the first film festivals I did, Gene and I did it together, you know, with our short films, and we're still friends. And so that, I don't think I could have done it without having that community, you know, um, because it, it's, it's lonely, you know, there are lonely things about it. But having friends, and having talented friends, and friends that you can, you can bring with you, um, you know, Tamara Tooney is also the voiceover of Eve and Eve's Bite. You know, having long friendships like that. She was there for my first film. She's there. She was in Cape Man's Valentine. She's there for my last film. And and um, and and Debbie and just you know those people around you and Terrence. You know, for Terrence and I to have done four movies together and then an opera. You know what I mean? It's like we're related. So this becomes like your family and they give you strength, and they um, give you perspective, you know, and keep you grounded as well. Terrific, thank you so much. And one of the things that um, you've done in your films, obviously, is focus on the complexities and tensions, but you've also focused on the joy and mm -hmm. fabulousness mm -hmm. of African-American culture, mm -hmm. black people in general. And so as we think about your legacy, can you talk to us a little bit about that representation? Because it's gone, it's global, right? I mean, your awards, et cetera. So talk, us, talk to us about the importance mm -hmm. of focusing on also, not just the negative, but the joy, the fabulousness mm -hmm. of who we are in all the intra-community mm -hmm. versus inter. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, you know, it's nothing that I, that I thought of ahead of time, really. But like I said, inspired by Toni Morrison, right? Um, it was more, it was being authentic and being authentic to who, my, to my experience of who we were. Because I grew up in black world until I was eight years old. Until I was eight years old, I knew very, 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 very few white people. And, and the world was rich and fabulous and people were beautiful. and. You know, there were um, kings and queens, you know, and beggars, right? There's hierarchies of, of you know, social strata and behavior. And, um, and I don't know, I wanted to speak to that. And, and it, it's, it's become increasingly important to me. It's interesting, after Eve's Bayou, um, I, wrote, I wrote a couple of scripts, and I wrote a very popular script that was uh, with white characters. I've written many scripts. that, that um, I've written a um, Napoleonic love story. You know, I've written all kinds of scripts. But I keep coming back to us because the work still needs to be done on, on um, presenting us authentically. And, um, but now, as a teacher, being part of international voices, especially at NYU Grad Film, where, where I'm a professor, um, and just bringing everybody's unique perspective to film, because I always look at it like if it were a time capsule and you know somebody from another planet were to come and, we're, and this is how, this is what they found. Maybe we're gone, but film exists. And they, that needs to be a very broad, balanced, complex, dimensional picture of who we are, because, because we are 
incredibly multidimensional. And, um, and so the, the thought that it's mostly white men doing this work of preserving our culture is absurd, right? And so it became militant. It became kind of a mission of mine to stay in the game, you know? And, um, and, and once I had children, it became a mission of mine to be um, a working, you know, mother and filmmaker. And uh, I don't know, I, I think that this fostering these voices and this kind of diversity and the, these perspectives, it's become kind of a, um, a life mission of mine to bring that about in other generations. Absolutely, and, and as, you, as we think about generations, actually, and this is a, um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about Eve's Bayou, but also as we get to Harriet mm -hmm. and the upcoming Whitney, is about this cross-generational conversation mm -hmm. that you actually bring to light in Eve's Bayou, but then through your films, right, it's this conversation across time and representation and thinking about who we are as black people. So talk to us a little bit more about representing such iconic figures, mm -hmm. right, as we move through the arc of your career to Harriet and now Whitney. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about that as well. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, characters and real people as characters, you know, that's, that's interesting, but I find myself talking a lot about women, honestly. I mean, sometimes men can talk to me, you know, but I find myself talking about women a lot, you know, um, because we're, we're so complex and fascinating. But, you know, but I, I don't know, it's really about um, people and um, bringing the people to life. And I do it the same way that I think of um, creating a character is the same way you look at a real person. You know, Harriet, um, I tried to bring her towards me. I tried to hear her voice. You know, I, tried, I meditated on her and who she was. And, and um, I felt that I was in a conversation with her. And, and that's the way I look at all characters. It's really their people. Well, this is my final question. I got the. Mm -hmm. um, and this is really, we have a lot, and you've already spoken to this, and you are an incredible mentor, teacher, educator. Thank you for contributing to future generations in so many ways. And I just want to commend you on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. So our last question really is, as, we, as you think about aspiring actors, writers, and directors who are here with us today, I've already shared some of the uh, words you've given to your, teacher, to, to your students, but talk to us about the importance of telling our own stories and the vulnerability needed. Yeah, I, I mean, I've always thought that great art should be um, a little embarrassing and painful. And when we're trying to give, like I said, I'm attracted to the messiness, the gray air, areas in, in humanity, um, and, and I find the beauty in that. And in order to create authentically, I always say, um, the tears have to hit the keypad. You have to be willing to, to, to investigate yourself. You have to be willing to be vulnerable. You have to be fully, fully human in order to be a good artist. You know, we're not protecting, you know, we, we protect actors, but we expose characters, right? You know, you, you expose characters because, um, when they bleed and when they cry, uh, you know, and live and die and love, that's what, that's what makes us recognize ourselves and humanity. Thank you so much for this incredible conversation. Tears on the keyboard. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Kimmel, really. So we have a very special presentation coming up and I'd just like to uh, say, Phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. My colleague, Dr. Karen Jackson Weaver, will join us now for this presentation. And thank you to all of you for being here. Good afternoon, everyone. It's so wonderful to see all of you. We have a very special presentation. Thank you so much for that wonderful conversation, Dr. Coleman and Professor Lemons. I'm Dr. Karen Jackson Weaver, the Senior Associate Vice President of Global Faculty Engagement and Innovation Advancement at NYU. And I'm honored and delighted to be here with you to celebrate, break, to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Eve's Bayou for the festival's Legacy Spotlight. Let's give it up again for Professor Lemons. 
you, you all know that Professor Lemons is an award-winning director, and she's also an NYU professor, and we have a special prize for you today. We know that we have many NYU alum, parents, faculty, staff, students, friends, and many partners here today, and we are thrilled to present one of the university's highest honors to Professor Lemons. I would like to invite Stephanie and Floyd Rance, Kelly Jackson from the festival to join me and Dr. Coleman in presenting this very special award to Professor Lemons on behalf of our president, Dr. Andrew Hamilton, and our board of trustees. And it reads as follows. The NYU Dorothy Irene Height Award. Presented to Professor Casey Lemons in recognition of transformational leadership and artistic innovation given on August 2022. Yay. 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 